QuickBooks Pro Desktop 2021, new vendors setup and accounts payable beginning balances. Let's get into it with Intuit's QuickBooks Pro Desktop 2021. Here we are in our Get Great Guitars practice file homepage. We currently have the open windows open. You can open the open windows by going to the view dropdown and selecting the open windows list. We're going to be entering the vendors here. So we'll enter new vendors and we'll enter the accounts payable balance, which will be linked to those vendors as we have a beginning balance in the accounts payable the vendors are people that we pay as opposed to customers are the people that pay us a couple things we want to do as we enter the vendors have the vendors in place so that when we do things such as enter a bill that we're going to that we're going to set up that we're going to pay to a vendor we will have the vendors that will be populated for that also if we were to write a check uh, we want to have the vendors in there so we can make those types of payments now note as we enter the vendors you might have a list of vendors uh, that you want to enter into the system. However, it's probably less as important as possibly the list of customers you enter into the system because when you think about the customer side of things, you're often thinking about people that uh, you want to make sure you have their address and their contact information. We want to send them the, the newsletter and whatnot and all that kind of stuff. Vendors aren't so much the case here. So a, a lot of the vendors might be people that we are paying and all we really want from them is going to be who and you know what where do i send the check and what's the name i need to be putting on the check or what are the payment ways that i can set up so that i can pay the vendors when the vendors need to be paid however there are probably some vendors such as if we purchase inventory that are very important to us and we want to make sure that we have the contact information and all the stuff to build a you know a good relationship with the vendor and have the data in our system in that sense as well now, if you're a new company and you're entering data and you haven't entered any vendor information, it's, again, probably not as important because you can enter the vendor information as you go, meaning you can go in right into your bills and enter bills or enter checks and just enter the vendors as you go, such as the phone bill, the utility company like a Verizon or an electric company or something like that, and you can enter them as you actually enter the data into the system. Uh, but you might have a list of vendors that you want to enter in first and that could help you to, to not make a mistake in the data entry. If you want to be consistent with entering the vendors and make sure that the names line up possibly to a prior accounting system or something like that, then you might want to, to you know, have the vendor list that, to make sure you have the names specified in the, in the right format. There's no misspelling and whatnot in the names. The other thing we want to take a look at is if we're putting the vendors into a system where we had an accounting system prior to this and we have some beginning balances then, that we need to be entering into the current system, we wanna put those in place as well. So this would only take place if we're moving from a prior accounting system in some way, shape or form to the current system where we have vendors that we owe money to already and we wanna enter that as of this point in time. For example, if we say that these are our beginning balances, we have an accounts payable balance of 15,000. I cannot just enter 15,000 into the QuickBooks system because QuickBooks is going to say, well, who do you owe that money to? I won't let you put me <laughs> put 15000 into accounts payable unless you also link it to a vendor so we can have the subsidiary report, which will tell us who you owe the money to. So that's what we'll do now. We'll enter who, you know, the vendor and the beginning balance, and then QuickBooks will create this account. Note QuickBooks will also put the other account somewhere because it needs two accounts for the double entry accounting system. You would think it would put it into opening balance equity, but it may not, right? It might put it into because the bill, the, the item that would typically be used when accounts payable goes up is the form called a bill. And a bill will typically be the other side will be oftentimes an expense. So that means that it's going to hit an income statement account. And so we got to be careful about when it hits an income statement account. We will account for that by the fact that we're going to be entering it prior to the cutoff date, our cutoff date at the beginning of the year, January 1st, 2020. And therefore, when it goes into the income statement, as of our cutoff date, it will roll into the equity account and won't be a factor. So uh, we'll see that as we go. All right, so I'm going to minimize this and we're going to go to our vendor section, which you can click on the vendor item up top, or you can go to the vendor dropdown up top and go into the vendor center. So vendor center is going to look a lot like the customer center, but for vendors. And then I'm going to close out this little window up top. So let's close out that window. We can make this a little bit wider by, by moving this these three dots down here to the right. The only vendor we have thus far is the one we set up when we set up our sales tax. So we have the sales tax vendor here. Uh, and, and we don't owe them any, any money at this point in time. 
So the other vendor we're gonna set up uh, is gonna be this information. Now you might have vendors, once again, from a database program or another software that you can export to, for example, Excel, or you can export it to you know, some other kind of spreadsheet program. And then you can you could do the same process we did in the past, lining up basically the, the data in the format is pro, it is provided to us based on the prior database program and then thinking about how to enter it into the current system. Now we only have one vendor we're going to enter here, so it'll be it'll be easy and I'll just do it with a one enter instead of the full data input. But you have the same options as we did when you were entering data into the um, into uh the customers and, and for example the items so you could hit the drop down up top you can go to new vendor we can enter them one at a time and you'll see the data input screens are much the same as we saw for the customer screens it's just now we're on the vendor side of things the the only required field really is the is the vendor name up top but all this other information might be necessary it's probably less necessary for most vendors than it is on the customer side of things where the contact information is quite important because we want to make sure we're maintaining communication and not just simply, you know, doing the business transactions. We want to send them our, our newsletter and whatnot. So let's close this back out. The other way you can do it is, of course, to hit the drop down and go to add multiple vendors, add multiple vendors, and then you can adjust your vendor data input in the same fashion as we did for the um, the customers and enter your data in that format by customizing and then simply copy and paste your vendor list in there once you have the headers set up in the format that you think that they need to be to line up to, to what you have in your excel sheet now since we only have one vendor i'm just going to add the vendor as a as a one-time vendor this time instead of doing this data input process because we've seen that a few times at this point so i'm going to close this back out and we're just going to add a new vendor. I'm going to hit the drop down. I'm going to add a new vendor. Now, the similar process will be for the for the customer. You know, this is a similar data input uh, for the customer side of things with the with the data here. So I'm going to will I will provide you. We will provide you with this worksheet so you can see uh, the information. The information we have is the vendor name, company name. This is the contact information. Epiphone happens to be who we buy our guitars from. So we're going to be buying and selling guitars. So this is going to be our major vendor. Uh, and then we're going to say that our contact with that, within that vendor is Sam Rand. And the phone number is here. The email address is here. Uh, they are also located in 90210 Beverly Hills. And this is going to be, the, that's a fake address, but it's a home for sale if you want to purchase it. But And this is 15000 That's the 15000 that that we owe them and 12 and we want to put them that in as of 12 31 2020 the day before the cutoff date that we're going to start our accounting system in quickbooks as of which will be january 1st 2021 i'm going to move in this into the other side of my my screen my second screen over here and then we'll just enter this one at a time into the system so we got the company name uh, well, let's enter the beginning balance first the beginning balance uh, you're only going to enter beginning balances you know, when you first start the QuickBooks system, and then you'll never use this field again, 15,000. And this is going to be as of 12, 31, 20. Once again, the day before the, the cutoff date, This that's important because it's quite likely that this QuickBooks will record this on an income statement account. And if it's in the current period, it might double, double count uh, the expense. So we want to make sure it's in the prior period so it rolls into equity. So then we're going to say, all right, the company name is going to be Epiphone. I'm going to type in Epiphone, but I messed up and I'm on the wrong sheet. So let's go in here, Epiphone, Epiphone, and full name. I'm going to say the name is, I'm going to say Sam, last name Rand, and I'm going to say job title. I'll skip that. I don't have one here. The phone number is going to be 999 222 and then the email is going to be sam at epiphone, epiphone.com. And then we have, let's see, I'm going to, I'm moving my information on the Excel sheet. Work phone, we don't have one. Email, second, no. Mobile, don't have the mobile. Fax, no, we don't have one. And then we got Sam ran down here. So epiphone, I'm going to put the address then, which is going to be. 807 Cynthia Street, 
Beverly Hills, California 90210. And I'm going to copy that over to the uh, shipping address. So I'm going to copy that over and say, okay, let's copy that there. So there we have that. And then the payment settings, uh, account number, client limits. We, could, we might have a limit there, payment terms. So we could set the terms. We'll, we'll talk more about that as we start to do the data input. Billing uh, rate level. So you can have a billing rate level. So you can check into that if you want more information on that. Print name on the check. So when we actually write the check, this is the most important thing. Oftentimes when we're just trying to pay somebody like a phone bill or something like that, we just need to know who to pay and uh, where to send it, how to pay, you know. And then we have the tax information, vendor tax ID, uh, vendor eligible for a 1099. Note that uh, to track the 1099 information, which means that the IRS is going to require us to send 1099s to some people, then this will help us to generate reports based on who who is is owed a 1099. So if you're careful about this and you check this off to the people that you need to owe a 1099 to, it'll make it easier at the end of the year to determine who you need to make a 1099 for. And the general rules are if it's a large company or if it's a company rather than a sole proprietorship or something like that, then you typically will not need to 1099. If it is a sole proprietorship, you very well likely will unless it's under a certain dollar threshold, but it's a pretty low threshold. So it's most likely that you're talking about sole proprietorships, contractors and whatnot where you would have to 1099 them, you might want to check that off with them to make it easier at the end of the year to determine who you need to send a 1099 to, giving one both to the vendor and to the IRS. So the IRS knows that that individual needs to be reporting their taxes so the IRS can take some of their money. So then we have the account settings uh, here and we have the additional uh, information for the, for the vendor type. You could set up the vendor type consultant and so on uh, we're going to keep it and that can help you to kind of sort your vendors but we're going to keep it with our one vendor up top so let's go back up top and there we have it uh, note that if you want to make a vendor like inactive so you don't want to see them anymore you paid them in the past they in that but now you don't use them then you can make them inactive down here that can be really useful because you don't really want to delete the vendor oftentimes but you want to make it inactive so you're not dealing with the with with it in your list of vendors if they're no longer someone that you are paying regularly so let's say okay so i'm going to say okay here so there we have it so now our vendor has been set up that looks good notice it set up one bill already for the vendor so the type of form that it used to set up the beginning balance that we made was a bill so then i'm going to open up our window to the left if i go to the home page now if I was to then uh, enter a purchase order or a bill, let's go into a bill and say, I'm going to pay Epiphone. I'm going to purchase a guitar. I'm not going to actually do it, but you know, if we were to purchase a guitar, then we have the drop down and we could say there's, there's Epiphone uh, right there. So there's our vendor closing this back out. Also note that as we go and we'll see examples of this, you could then enter new vendors you know as you enter the bill so if i was to enter a phone bill or something like that i can simply add the company like a verizon or at&t as i enter the bill we'll see examples of that in uh, the future let's close this back out let's go to our reports now we should see the accounts payable showing up on the balance sheet so let's go to the reports drop down we're going to go to our company and financial and on down to the balance sheet standard report one of our favorite financials here we're going to say this is going to be as of 12 31 20 and now we have the payable down here. There's our accounts payable, the 15,000 in the accounts payable. If we double click on that 15,000 to zoom into it, we see that once again, it's a bill type of form. Even though we entered it into the opening balance data screen, QuickBooks set it up as a bill form. Why? Because the bill form is usually the form that will be used to increase the accounts payable. That's what the bill basically means. It means accounts payable went up. So if I double click on it, we see now it has transposed our 15,000 that we enter into the opening balance into a bill. But where did they put the expense side to it? Well, they put it into this category that they made up called un uncategorized expenses, which is not a category that doesn't make any right. So that but that means it went to the income statement, which can be a problem if it was in the current time period, because we don't it might be double counting then uh, the, the, the income in the current time period. Uh, so, but for us, it's okay because we entered it as of the day before 
the year that we're going to start doing the data input and therefore that income statement amount will roll into equity and will not be a factor after the cutoff date in which we're going to start our data entry. So I'm going to close this back out. We'll check that out in a second. I'm going to close this back out. You can see now in the net income down here, it's at the 5,500. If I double click on that, you'll see the two items that, that uh, were, were input in here. Uh, well, the, the three, but these are all the one data input we put in there for the accounts receivable. There's the income and there's the bill. There's the accounts payable side that they put into an expense. So there's the income and expense detail that went in basically to the income statement. But uh, so, so that's wrong really as of 1231.20, but it's gonna go away as of the first day of the next period. Meaning if I go to the first day, the cutoff date that we're talking about here, the, the uh, notice net income went, went away, now it went into the equity. There's no net income. Let's take a look at the income statement or, or the profit and loss reports drop down company and financial profit and loss and if i set the dates as of 010120 to 123120 because we entered this as of 123120 the day before we're going to start the year that we're actually going to do the data input there's our 15000 they put into this uncategorized expense which isn't like a real thing so notice this whole statement is wrong right because it's not categorized it's wrong but that's a bit key because it's before the cutoff date here and which is January 1st, 2021, that we're going to start doing the data input. And so if you want to, if so, anybody that's using our data, if they want to look at anything that happened before the cutoff date, they don't look at this system. They have to look at what other prior accounting system we were using at that point in time. This system is correct as of January 1st, 2021 going forward. And if I was to move this up to January 21, 2021, January 1st, 2021, then uh, then we see there's no activity in the current year that we're going to be working in. And that's the point. So we don't want any temporary accounts in the current year we're working in. Um, and also note that if you had to enter this data in the year that you're working in and you entered a beginning balance and it shouldn't be there because it was in the prior period, then you'd have to adjust it with a journal entry, meaning you'd have to then go in here and... and uh, and do a journal entry to get rid of that 15,000, which means you would um, credit the uncategorized expense by the 15,000 and debit the proper equity account to put it into the proper equity account. Okay, let's go back to the balance sheet in the open windows. So, so now we have this 15,000 here. We should also see a subsidiary account telling us who we owe that money to because that represents us owing money, but we need to know who we owe it to so we're going to go to the reports up top. We're going to go to the company and financial. I'm not, not company and financial. We're going to the vendors and payables. And let's go to the vendor balance summary report. And th that's going to give us our one vendor. There's Epiphone. There's the 15,000. The total of the summary report, as long as the dates line up, should, should be equal to, back to the balance sheet, the amount that is going to be reported on the balance sheet. So you can see now that uh, that uh, we're, we're moving along with our beginning balances over here. So now we have the 15,000 in place on the beginning balance. The other side rolled into the equity account. So it's the other side's in equity. We want it all to be in, op in, in the owner's equity. Some of it's in opening balance at this point in time. So at the end of the, in other words, uh, if I if I go back over here, some of the equity the total equity is going to be right at the end of the day if we get everything else if we get every other account right total equity will be right but some of it will be in opening balance and whatnot and we'll just do a journal entry to put everything into the proper account for us being the uh, owner's equity account at the end of that process